Welcome, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. So if you don't mind taking a seat, if you need some extra things, I have some more in the back, too, but you're welcome to sit anywhere. We're so glad that y'all are here today. Thank you for joining us at the Atlee Branch Library. Um, we are recording this on Zoom, and we have some that are coming in as live feed as well. So um, we appreciate y'all physically being here so that we have somebody to actually look at while everybody's talking. So thank you very much for being here. And we really want to thank um, Marine Corps Captain, correct, Bob Wooder. And we definitely want to be able to listen to his sharing of opportunity or for his experiences during uh, the Vietnam. So I'm going to lead it on to you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for extending this special ending, this special event. We get tonight together to uh, commemorate our veterans' past and present. And I am pleased to be able to share my story of service with you. A tour of duty in Vietnam, 1965. I want to thank the Atlee, the Monkey Regional Library, the young lady that was just here, for hosting, and certainly uh, Anne Marie, the manager here, for hosting and promoting tonight's set and supporting our veteran community. You know, this is Veterans Time. Marine Corps just had a 248 year anniversary. They were the second oldest outfit protecting the country, first was the Navy. So back on the 10th, the day before the Veterans Day, they had that birthday of 248. So, you know, I'm sure that there are lots of other people who are not here who are no longer with us at all, which you might have been So we're going to talk a little bit about that in just a few minutes. <clears throat> My talk is a personal reflection of 10 months in Vietnam in the northern portion of the Corps from April through October 1965. I was in the Vietnam battle zone, as it was known, and also served for eight years in the Marine Corps. However, before introducing myself, I'd like to mention the names of some of my fellow service members who did not make it home and died in the service of their country. That would be Frank Reisner, the Constance Marine, who earned the Medal of Honor, worked with him in Vietnam, and then Paul Gormley, a former company commander. He was killed while he was in Vietnam. Possibly you have names of your own that you'd like to recognize. As well as I ask, it would begin our time this evening with a moment of silence that we take with me a moment, say prayers for these folks if you're so inclined, and we'll take this moment of silence. Remember these fallen veterans. Please join me in a moment of silence. Amen. Okay, during the presentation phase uh, of tonight's uh, event, <clears throat> I appreciate if you hold your questions to the end so that I can answer them appropriately at that time. My name is Bob Woodard. I was born <clears throat> and raised in Norfolk, Virginia, graduated from William Mary Norfolk with a BA in history. I trained in Quantico, you know. A little ways up the road here, and was commissioned in 1962 as an infantry officer. For three years, the Marine Corps trained us very well for the event called war. During 1965, 
I was in the South Vietnamese battle zone, as I expressed earlier. We landed on April the 10th, 1965, on the beach outside of Penang. <clears throat> the enemy was there, and they decided to start shooting at us as we came in. So it was a hot thing. Didn't last long. We subdued it shortly. But it did happen. Our battalion, which is known as 2nd Battalion, 3rd Marines, was assigned to provide security for the Da Nang Air Base. And it's probably hard to see that from the back row back there, but if you come up and take a look at the sketch, that's Da Nang in the sector, and you'll see that the air base is there. While there in Da Nang in the Vietnam area, I was the executive officer, which was the second in command of a company of about 200 Marines. And I also had an opportunity to be in a weapons between country. Tonight's presentation looks at these events from April through October with H Company, 2nd Battalion, 3rd Marines. It will include stories of the two cathedrals and the mine, two major battles, civic action, and new 1965 concepts in 1965. Now, not today, but back in 1965. A daily work schedule for the company and the weather. Let's look at the first story. The first story was about the theme. <laughs> you look over there on the map later on. Dallas says Vermont. Vermont had been taken over by the communists something like seven years before we got there. And they blew both of the bridges that were the road leading into the village. They blew up two bridges at the five-year and seven-year mark. So the people in the village complex, which was uh, a rather large, it was about 7,000 people there, could not get the market. I mean, they could raise rice and uh, other products, but they couldn't get it to market and make money off of it. So they were isolated by the, uh, the BC. So when we came in, one of the first things we did is rebuilt both of those bridges. And you can see some uh, kind of, uh, photographs that come up of a sign in front of the bridge. It's written in both Vietnamese as well as English explaining what it was to rebuild the bridge. <clears throat> we also, uh, in that same area, had this, uh, what appeared on an intelligence photograph, you were talking about intelligence earlier, the aircraft intelligence above the sky. Well, this intelligence photograph showed well, it looked like a church on the ground. And a whole bunch of hooches or huts around it, which would represent what we call a hamlet or a village. Well, this was five miles west of the mine that I was talking about. I mean, and uh, so the battalion told us to take our company right out there in battle formation of course and factor kill and to see if there was any VC activity out there. It turned out when we got out there we saw that most of the uh huts and the uh, environments that they were living in didn't have any roofs. So we're looking at them through binoculars you know big ass and so it looked a little strange and then we'll, Looked a little bit further over to the right, and it was this big, huge building. It wasn't a church. It was a Catholic cathedral. It was a large Catholic cathedral. And we said, what in the world? Good gracious. So we actually went into the village, searched around, went into the cathedral, and we found, you know, the that this uh, building had been abandoned years ago, and there was no DC activity in, in there. But inside the Catholic Cathedral, 
We found stained glass windows, an altar, what was left of it, and a beautiful religious object. Most of the inside, though, and like, you know, it was twice as wide as this room is as you walk down, was quite beautiful. However, the roof had caved in many years ago. And so the debris was laying all over everything. But in the abandonment of the cathedral, they'd taken out all the uh, religious objects that they could, including the huge, you know, for services where people would sit, so like they're sitting behind seats and so forth. They took all those out. So everything was covered by this debris that came down from the ceiling. So we found out there was no activity there. But the strange thing about this was, you need to think about this. All of a sudden, here's this beautiful cathedral in the middle of nowhere. So the left of it was the beginning of the jungle in the mountains right behind it. And in front of it was just all rice paddies. To see such a big, beautiful cathedral in the midst of all of what was going on, are you kidding me? That was an extraordinary event. I mean, it was like, how come this happened? What happened here? Think about that. Is it possible? But there's some kids in the room. Well, we sort of found out, indicated to us that the DC chased them out. It's called communism. In the story of the second cathedral, we were given a similar order of tag, if you want, to see if there's what kind of activity is going in the village. This one, so it being five miles out, it was 14 miles out. So we started about 5.30 in the morning, got all of our people together, over 200 of us, started heading out for that objective. And the closer we got there, it was like 14 miles, as I said, as we arrived there. But uh, 1 p.m. in the afternoon, as we got there, we took the binoculars and started looking at them because we were coming up out of some cooning grass. Cooning grass grew about this time. And sometimes it's shorter than that, but we're in the cooning grass, so you couldn't really see us because we were in the cooning grass. We could see them because we were using big eyes. And we, once again, we said, oh, there's another one of these Catholic cathedrals. And right beside it was a major building that was full of kids. And these children were all over the place running, playing soccer, and all kinds of good things that kids love to do, balls and so forth. And it was like 50 to 75 of them. And it was a very, very, it turns out that the more we looked at it before we moved closer, we saw that it was an extremely uh, active community. There's a lot of people in it, and they were trading with each other and doing the daily chores that would be found in the menu. Hamlet structural or village complex. So we said the close we got, we could see that the children, it was an unusual thing about it. They were all black. And as we walked closer to them, they couldn't leave us alone. They had to come in amongst us in our combat formations and touch our skin. Not my skin, but my black our black marines. And then they were so fascinated with that, they had to get into the hair. It's, and because so many of them didn't have uh, you know what we'd say like kinky type hair. They didn't have that. Their hair was straight. And I thought to myself as I got closer, this is foolish. You should remember where they came from. They came from Niger, Djibouti, and French Guiana in Africa. And that was 14 years ago. But these kids did not know their parents. Furthermore, they hadn't seen any black people because they'd been taken and isolated in this Catholic orphanage. 
And the average age was probably between 11 and 14 years of age. And so they were really fascinated with my guys. Well, we took a couple hours, rested up a little bit, talked to a lot of the kids, trying to talk to them and understand what they were seeing in Vietnamese, as well as a few of us who spoke French, because they also spoke French. And we talked with the uh, the two Catholic priests, one who was running the orphanage and one who was uh, running the cathedral. And it really was gorgeous inside of us. Unbelievably beautiful. So we made contact with them and, sit and told them that we would go back to our battalion and make sure that the civic action people who had all these supplies and everything would be able to come out there and make contact with them and let them know before we sent a truck out there or whatever it is we were going to send, whether it's a helicopter or a truck to take uh, supplies out there to them. So, uh, and then we left. But I must tell you, this was what we call a love fest. I mean, it was so exceptional. I mean, you just don't get those opportunities in life. It was unbelievable. Even in the midst of all this war, these kids couldn't keep their hands off of our guys. They were just utterly astounded. It was so like a Martian spaceship had landed, and their fathers came walking out of the spaceship to take them home. That's what they thought. So, along with the excitement and heartwarming exchanges and so forth, the reality was, you know, we had to leave. It was unfortunate we couldn't spend more time taking care of the kids at that particular point, but we turned it over to civic affairs and that was really a good So their fathers had been in the French army. And as you probably recall, if you read uh, history, those events that the French were sent to that after the Declaration in 1954. But they came here in about 46 after World War II to recover part of their territory. And of course, the Vietnamese had risen up against them. That was the Viet Minh at that time. But as for the time frame, we were in, they changed their name over to Viet Cong. So we left. And the story about the two battles. The first large scale operation was conducted during the August 1965. And it was about 25 miles south of Denang. Once again, if you look at the sketch over there, you can see that. Denang is over there and it's south of Denang, down the coast. And it was the operation was called Starlight. It was essentially an operation run by the Marines and the Navy. And we were sent there from the Navy. We flew in to help them out in the battle. But we were sent there to protect the airfield, Chulai, Marine Air, uh, Marine Air, you know, at an air base there. So we were sent there to help them out. So when we got there, we were attached to another battalion. Remember, it was just a company of us, so like 200 plus of us that flew down. We were attached to another company uh, in another battalion. That battalion was called 2 4, second battalion, four planes. <clears throat> so we were attached to them. The following morning, when we took over their positions by that time inside the airstrip there, they flew out of a helicopter and went into the battle. Oh boy, that was a terrible battle. Battle itself went on between five and seven days, the best I can come. <laughs> the Navy ship, ships offshore, provided the Marines uh, to put ashore ambiguously. They uh, also, the Navy provided naval gunfire where they could shoot you know, 10 miles in them with their guns and supply, resupply items for the Marines support on the beach. The Marines landed on the beach and uh, they went in inland and they made the assaults on the VC strongholds. 
And as I said earlier, there's about 8,000 people involved in the breach and more. And from the Navy standpoint, there's with all the trips along, there was probably about 7,000 people. That's a heck of a lot of people. And that was during the month of August 1965. The second battle, the second story, is about Harvest Moon. Harvest Moon occurred in December of 1965, just as I was beginning to leave and go back. The battle started down south of the name once again, and it was like 35 miles further south down the coastline. So they put us in the airplane once again and we flew down. And in this case, the reason that we went there for the battle was because the Vietnamese Army was having a hard time fighting the DC, so they needed the Marines to help them out in the battle. So that's why we went there. What well, in, in this case, once again, there was a large amount of Marines who were involved in this. So what you might have figured before it was only five thousand Marines. I want to there's sort of a strange thing oddity of this particular incident that occurred. About the same time that we were getting ready to get aboard the helicopters and fix when we were ready to make a journey down into uh, <clears throat> the Hoiyan area. I received a report. My time was up. In other words, I spent my 13 months in the battle room in Vietnam as well as in uh, Thailand chasing communist tourists down there too uh, and offshore of Vietnam several times. So my time was up, it's time for me to go home. So it's sort of a strange circumstance in the way that I said goodbye to him one morning was they were getting on the helicopters flying on the morning on. And by the way, it's on the back of there. He died. I should have been on And um, it was heart wrenching in a way to say goodbye to guys that I worked with, you know, for over a year uh, because we started out together back in California, California, before we came into to Vietnam. So it was a strange circumstance. I went one way, and they went the other. Little did I know in that battle, my company commander was going to be killed. He was killed in an ambush. It was a large scale ambush. We had an artillery officer who was there as a forward reserve calling artillery for support to our company, H Company. And so he was a senior officer present, so he took over. I mean, the company fought through the battle. Believe me, he earned it. He earned the battle. His name was Harvey Farmer. It took me almost 25 years to get that word. It's all from his base to base. He found an instant that was strange. It's Fine people, even though you tried a lot. It took me about 25 years. One day I was in Norfolk. You know, one race, they had an anniversary uh, meal. So as a little bomb recipient, he was there because he was the president of the association. So I said, well, I guess you go take a look at that. He was like, I got there. He got the machine and started walking and he introduced himself. I was like, I did a few minutes ago. I said, oh, well, this is going to be looking for for 25 years, here he is talking to. Him. So I had a chance to talk to him. He explained the events that happened. Um, it was interesting. Okay, let's jump over to the uh, talk about uh, civic action. Some people would call it pacification. Most of this is centered around the village of Lamai, which is north of the name. It's probably five, at least five miles north of the name. It's a Catholic controlled village. We've got a lot better uh, response to the things that we're trying to do to help them out with from the Catholic communities as opposed to the Buddhist communities. I mean, at that time, the Catholics represented probably 35% of the population. 
the Buddhists represented about 65%. And we just found a lot more success with uh, the Catholics than we did with the Buddhists. It didn't stop us from trying to do good things for the Buddhists also, but we seem to have better results with that. By the time we got there and started working with Lamai, the religious organizations and church relief and uh, organizations were sending our battalion about two to three tons of civic action supplies each month. So that included food, building supplies, equipment, clothes, livestock, and fertilizer. Uh, our company H gave out about 400 pounds per month plus. And the best we can estimate that probably overall we we'll gave out at least 3,000 pounds of maturity. We also served the community in the medical building quite well. That was probably one of the most popular places. We think that from our records, it indicates that about 1,500 to 3,000 people per month came into that medical facility that we built for them. For medical reasons, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of supplies. So it's extremely popular. <laughs> think about that. Most people have no idea that all that civic action is going to the Bristol office. So, in fact, I mentioned it one time in one of my Sunday school sessions, and they said, You ought to be kidding me. They were doing that. They had ditches and building houses, building stucco structures, rebuilding the uh, ones that were torn down during the war. In providing medical attention and so forth, they're amazing. Okay, <clears throat> we got to be so popular that our commanding general, Ball Marines and Marine Corps, came in there and we'll see some photographs in Very shortly up here on the screen, that was on the bridges. But so, uh, General Walt, the senior uh, Marine Corps general, came in there quite frequently. So did General Westwoman, who was the overall. Commander of all the troops in, in Vietnam, as well as General Wheeler in the Air Force, there often too. And good old Uncle McNamara is there too. He had a piece of the action too. He wanted to see what was going on. So we had a lot of dignitaries to come down and look at this and see what was going on, including Vietnamese journalists. We had quite, quite a few Vietnamese journalists. Now, when they came in place for this look to kind of dog and pony show, we call it lost times, they had to have security. Yes, who got the security? H Company, not our company. So we ended up setting up security for Nine Run, Westwood, you know, all the crowd. They came down. So it became very popular. Okay, let's switch over to the next story, which is about new ideas. Remember now, this is 1965. We're not talking about today. The first one was called Operation Midnight. Nobody had ever done or completed <coughs> an helicopter assault at night. So we ran one in July, trying to track down a whole bunch of these cities that ran out of earth. And from the planning standpoint and from the execution standpoint, it was exceptional. It really was exceptional. Because uh, we brought together a large group of people and uh, healers and other fixed wing aircraft, and also from the Navy to get illumination the night weather to shoot 10 miles inland and these flare. Uh, products would go up in the air and just sort of like make everything daylight. We did that too. So that was a first. The Marine Corps was the first to be doing that. Nobody else could try that. Of course, afterwards, there's a lot of people that did do that. By the way, it, we came in under fire. 
We definitely wish you had some in. The second item that I wanted to talk about was I talked about was called the CAP, Combined Action Platoon. What we did was we take a Marine that was in country and compose a squad of 14 Marines and then stick a Navy Pullman in there with them. And they would, they would work as a team for 30 days going through language school, Vietnamese language school in the night, and also uh, all about the Vietnamese customs because most of them had no idea about the Vietnamese customs at all. So this was an eye open for them. And then we take them out into these Catholic controlled areas because that's where we're getting our best results when we talked about that earlier. And they would start building a fort in the village. And then we start recruiting males, of course, to make up the other part of a platoon. A platoon usually consists of in those days of at least 45 people. So we already had 15. So what we would do is recruit in the village complex or in the immediate Hamlet area, uh, Vietnamese to come in. We would train them, give them weapons training. We would teach them tactics. We would teach them things to do about medicine and construction. In the meantime, we were helping them build houses, dig ditches. The corn, bless his heart, he turns out to be the box head, the doctor for everybody. And sometimes he's treated 3,000 people or 4,000 people because that's the only medical source for them out in these rural areas that are I mean, really way out where you know there are not too many roads around the road searches were not developed at that point. So we, we got a lot of results and you probably think well how long did the Marines stay there in that type of situation? The answer to that is the Marines had a 13 month tour. That's what I did. I did 13 months there. And so once they got trained and were inserted into this CAP program in the village somewhere, they stayed there the rest of that time for 13 months and then they pulled out and somebody would send them in as a replacement. Probably the most important thing was all of a sudden, because of the civic action stuff and the fact that we comprised and ran up the military organization that didn't exist there before and taught them tactics, how to shoot weapons. And to take care of weapons and protect the roads and things of that nature. All of a sudden, the VC were interested in hanging around and said they were getting killed off in these ambushes that we would set up. And, and uh, so they left. In many cases, the Vietnamese uh, communists in that particular time, the VC, they just got out of the area. Didn't mean they didn't come back again because they did occasionally. But we had over 100 of these settlements all strung up between the Nang and the Way. That's a lot of people. And in most cases, we were taking like 35 Vietnamese and bringing them in and training them like this. And they stayed there that full 13 months. Extremely successful. In the free enterprise system world, because we taught them how to get to market with that rice, how to use fertilizer and get a better return on their products, how to use equipment that they brought from the Civic Action Program with pumps that we used to move water from one rice paddy to another, to increase the, the uh, amount of crops and for the crops to be uh, blade resistant, for example, that was very, very important. So that was an extremely successful program. We even started in our battalion, but somebody else did. And by the way, that same idea was used in Iraq, and it was also used in Afghanistan. So sometimes these trends go on and work in other ways as well. The day of the work schedule, you might think about it again. What in the world did you do during the day? When did you get a chance to sleep and when did you work and that type of thing? So let's go down this. We usually three platoons in a, in a company. <clears throat> we would take one platoon. This is a schedule that I ran from 8 o'clock in the morning to 4 p.m. or thereabouts in the afternoon. 
One platoon was on daylight patrols. They went back into the villages. Sometimes they set up medical team things. Sometimes they set up ambushes. That was their responsibility, that one platoon. And they rode around in our radius of operation. Another platoon stayed right inside the perimeter and rebuilt and refurbished and reconstructed pillboxes, trenches, got the water out. You know, when, when uh, it rained so much and we were wandering around the water all the day long, they helped spill it out back into the pads. And then the last platoon would do what? Sleep. We, we changed the schedule about 45 to 60 days out when we got there because we found that most of the activities against us, the VC were at night after six o'clock. So here's what we did. We changed the schedule at six o'clock to midnight. 50% on alert. So half of the company from six until 12 was up with their rifle, machine gun, whatever, standing inside the room. After midnight, it changed to 100% alert. Everybody was awake and standing to it. And the reason being, once again, so VC usually would attack at about 10 o'clock at night and try to withdraw from the battle if they could get away with it at 3 o'clock in the morning. So that's why we had that schedule. A little bit about what sometimes we don't get in the freedom, but yeah. I was born and raised down on the coast where we got more rain than we did here. In Norfolk, we had 45 inches plus. Here you get 40 inches. The name is going to post in this 100 inches a year. I'm doing this, and I think I'm right about the monsoon. Did it run, run from, say, May through October? The monsoon, and then about right Yeah. 85% of the rain came down then. You know what that means? You walk around in water, knee deep, most of the time during that period of time, unless you got a cover over top of you and you're above the rice paddies. That was a rarity because most all the activities took place in the rice paddies and in the jungle and climbing up and down the mountains. So you didn't have any cover like that. So you just stayed wet all the time. I mean, you could take a shower, we about wet. Once a month, mm -hmm. good. We can take a shower. <laughs> and within a few minutes of stepping into the shower and drying off, we went all over again. <laughs> because of the humidity and the rain that was coming down on the sun. So those are some of the things that happened with the weather. And because of that, you can well imagine uh, my boots are here on the back table back there, and, and also my my jacket's here, you can look at this. But the type of material that we'll be using in our uniforms came in in March, April time frame, myself and the fellow Marines from the other units, was actually a twill. Well, a cotton twill is a heavier uh, gauge of material than uh, was used here in this. And so because of the twill, it would stay wet a lot, most all the time. It was just pure wet. And because it was wet, within 60 days to 90 days, it just fell off the body. The body was very off. So remember that. We were wandering through the rice paddies and climbing through the jungles and climbing up hills and mountains. And your clothing just wasn't made for that time. So we switched over to this material right here. You can look at this. Uh, it's very lightweight. It dries out extremely fast, and it's breathable. That's probably the most important thing. So it's a difference. Uh, the weather had a tremendous impact. This is no question that neither will have been in the way. Lots of it. Well, today I'm proud to say that I've remained in touch with my unit nearly 60 years later. We formed a group called 
the forgotten warrior. It's a non-profit. Get together somewhere in the United States and share uh, camaraderie, support for one another, and our families, and remember our friends. We lost many of our numbers as uh, the years have gone by, but also from the complication and of course the information, but also from the complications of our service, such as uh, lingering impact of Asian Orange Talk. Asian knowledge goes there. We've lost somewhere between 25 and 30 percent of the people coming from the Asian knowledge. In conclusion, I invite each here to come up and see the memorabilia I brought tonight and look at some of my photographs from here in this extremely public situation. Of all of the veterans groups and I answer the question. I can answer questions when the one at this point. If anyone would like to pose the questions here. Before we break up though, I'd like to uh, thank my wife Deb here and our son Buck for their uh, assistance in helping me with this and uh, bringing it to the, the screening and a lot of the publication of the photographs and some other things that we do. So thank you for your time tonight. God bless America. And I say, we will also. So if you like, if you want to look at this interview, maybe I can ask you a question that you can ask about. That means I can help you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 